Uh, let's see. I think we can go ahead and get started. We're already running a little bit late. Uh, so a couple things. Uh, the first, uh, or sorry, the second checkpoint for the second project is due this coming Sunday. So don't forget about it um, and make sure you submit something. Um, you know, as, as many of you may or may not know, uh, so this class is brand new, which you can probably tell because sometimes I screw up my slides. Um, but the department, in fact, or what we actually call faculty is also pretty new. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're trying to kind of build out like the infrastructure stuff as part of uh, that work. Uh, Boston University, which you may or may not be familiar with, uh, actually has kind of three levels of what's, you know, basically people who help out with the course. So we have somebody like Graham, who is a, a TF, which is a teaching fellow, uh, usually PhD, I think, candidate. I don't, I think they have to be beyond masters. I think they have to be in their PhD program. Uh, then you have a teaching assistant, which I think is masters or above, um, but it could be maybe a senior undergrad. I don't know. Uh, so, but basically kind of the higher level. So it's like TF is the highest then TA. There's another level called course assistant, uh, which is nowhere near as cool sounding in my opinion, um, but that's uh, for undergrads. So anybody who's taken this course and would like to help uh, kind of teach the next round of the course uh, can basically sign up here. Um, I'll throw the QR code up again at the end as well, or you can uh, you know, email me or something and I can send you the link. Um, so uh, personally, uh, as you might have discovered right uh, in the past, teaching something is actually one of the best ways to learn something. Uh, so you know, if you are interested in this subject and you want to kind of get more into it, uh, being a course assistant or being a TA uh, can be a big help to that. Uh, so we want to expand it to kind of other courses as well. But at this point, we're just doing DS100, this one. Um, and so this would actually be for spring. And the big thing, the reason we're putting up the form now is because registration is happening like now-ish for most of you. Um, and so we want to make sure if you are interested, you don't take class that collides with uh, when you might have to be available. So the general kind of, I can't remember exactly how many hours it is, but it's like five hours a week. Maybe it's four hours a week. Um, and it kind of fluctuates a little bit. But the idea is that you'd come to some of the discussions and help out with the labs along with Graham, um, you know, or, and then you also hold some office hours where you can help students uh, kind of work through homeworks and projects and that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes it's a, it's a bit less intimidating than coming and talking to us, right, me or Graham uh, for students. And so we like to try to offer something where, you know, a student is a little bit more on the same peer level rather than somebody who's, you know, might be, like I said, more intimidating. Make sense? Anybody have any questions? Um, I apologize, the form is kind of super long, um, but uh, it's basically to gather enough information to kind of qualify candidates. Um, it does ask about whether you've like taken the class and what your grade is. So just kind of put in, you know, not done yet or whatever, uh, and that's fine. Um, you know, I, like I said, I want to get it up now because you're registering now, even though, you know, we wouldn't actually make the selection until call it December, January, uh, to figure out who it is based on how you do in the class. So any questions? Make sense? Cool. All right. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, so we'll start with this one. Uh, so which one's bigger, the mean, the median, or are they the same? Um, and of course, I don't have my cheat sheet here, so I'm probably going to screw this up. Um, so what do you think? Right hand is mean and left hand is median and both hands is the same. Let's see what you got. I have to keep reminding myself which one's left and right. So it looks to me like it's gonna be the median is gonna be bigger because you have this skew out here, right? Um, so usually if there's a skew one way or the other, if it's going to, if it's to the left, that means the mean is going to be lower. And if it's to the right, it's going to mean, it's going to mean, it's going to average, I, I don't know, 
it's going to mean that the uh, the average is higher. All right. What about this one? Uh, oh wait. Oh yeah. Sorry. No. Here's the answer. I, look at that. I even thought ahead. Um, so it looks like the mean is 1986 and the median is 1989. So the mean is slightly lower than the median. Sometimes I think ahead and then I forget I think ahead and you know, there you go. All right, so what we've been talking about, right, is, you know, we're, we're kind of looking at how do we define variability. And so what we've been doing kind of thus far, right, is we've been looking at uh, kind of data sets and kind of trying to figure out information about them, right? So now we're starting to get into what if we want to look at maybe different data sets and kind of compare them to each other, okay? So we need a way to kind of go about doing that. And so we can kind of look at, you know, kind of like just comparing the, you know, like the mean and the max and the median, um, you know, or the mean or whatever. Um, however, that can be difficult, right? If, especially if the data sets are kind of wildly out of sync. Right. So what we want to do is kind of figure out a way to standardize them more so that we kind of compare them one to the other. So it's not so much whether they're different kinds of data, like I was using an example of like kilometers and miles, as much as um, like, you know, if one is, you know, you know, if, if one looks like this, right, and then you kind of take the same thing and flip it on the other side, right, and try to compare those two, um, even, you know, even if it's all maybe it's all skyscrapers in the US versus skyscrapers in Kuala Lumpur, um, and you want to compare the two, um, it can be a little weird, even if they're measured in the same amounts. That makes sense, right? So it can be a little complicated. So what we're going to talk about now is a way to approach that. And this approach, at least in my experience, right, this is probably something you've learned about or at least heard about. In fact, we even used it to give you kind of information about the midterm grades, um, but you may not know actually how it works. And so we're gonna talk about how it works. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the standard deviation, okay? And the way we get to the standard deviation is very complicated, except it's not really, it's just it's another one of those things where it's very hard to say and much easier to like type into a calculator. Um, or you know your Jupyter notebooks or whatever. So we take the data, then we basically average the data and look for the mean. Okay. Then we determine how far away each data element is from the mean. Okay. So basically subtraction, right? Then we take those deviations and we square them, okay, to kind of make them more uniform. Um, and then we take the mean of the squares itself. Okay. So we take that new average. And that's what we call the variance between them. Um, and you know that's useful in and of itself, but it's really not quite as far as we want to go. So what we want to do is actually take the square root of the mean uh, to get to the next, uh, to get to something that's more uniform. Um, and just kind of as a note, right, this is often referred to as the root mean square or RMS, um, and also known as the quadratic mean. Um, RMS, not to be confused with actually a very famous uh, computer science person uh, whose nick is RMS, um, who's done some questionable activities over the years, um, but still has a, a, done some also very interesting things. Uh, so does that make sense? We're going to talk about it. Obviously, we're going to get into a little more detail, show some examples, stuff like that. But the trick right, is to remember you take the data, then you take the averages, then you figure out how far away each data element is from the average, then you square those numbers, then you take the average of that, and then you square root it uh, basically at the end, right? And then, you're, then you have your standard deviation. So why? Um, basically, what we know is that no matter the shape of the distribution, the bulk of the data are in the range of the mean plus or minus a few standard deviations, okay? So I'm trying to figure out, and so I tried to write out exactly what I was saying before, right? But it's very, like I said, it's long, it's complicated, probably could use some commas. Um, but the idea is that if you kind of have that, that data element, right, which is that, that center point, um, then you can kind of look at distances away from it 
and you can kind of tell how much of, for lack of a better term, like the problem space or the sample space is within a few standard deviations away. Um, and it can get cooler than that in that, um, let's see if I can say this, Chabashev, is that how you say his name? So. Yeah, it's, it, uh, that's a tough one for me to pronounce. Um, Chabashev's inequality, uh, which is basically, no matter what the shape of the distribution, right? So we just said this bulk of the data are in the range of the mean plus or minus a few standard deviations. So, but to get more specific about it, the mean is plus or minus Z, so some variable Z, the standard deviations is at least one minus one divided by Z squared. Sorry, it looked like a really tall Z for a second there. Um, so this is basically the calculation that can tell you how, how big that is, um, because obviously that's more useful. Um, and I would note, right, there are methods to get even more sophisticated than that that we're not going to cover in this class. Um, but this is kind of a good starting point, right? It kind of tells you a little bit about uh, the sample space or the problem space uh, about it with the data set you have. So here's just kind of an example and trying to explain it. Um, so for example, if we had a mean of 10 and a standard D and three standard deviations, uh, then how many of the values are within, uh, you know, four to 16, okay? So um, like, so how, how much of the sample set that we have are between the values of four and 16, assuming that the mean is 10, right? And we wanna look at three standard deviations kind of out, okay, on either side. So I thought I had actually put the formula back, or did I put it in here? Yeah, you're right. So the formula is here. So what I want you to try to figure out is, is it basically right around 89% or is it right around 92%? And we'll do left and right hands again. Um, and so take a minute to, to see if you can work that out in your head or you, know, you should have a Jupyter notebook open. So I might just type it in if it were me uh, and then you could figure it out. All right, so right hands up if you think it's 89%. Was that enough time? People need more time? Raise both hands if you need more time. All right, so right hand up if you think it's around 89%, and left hand up if you think it's around 92%. We have to have like two thirds of the class or like three quarters of the class before we can move on. I will give you all another minute. So if you're holding your arm up, you can you can put it down for a minute. All right, let's try again. Right hand for 89% and left hand for 92%. Hands, more hands. I think there's a couple of hands I can't see because of the chairs. <laughs> so maybe a little bit higher. Uh, all right, that's pretty good. So the correct answer is it's right around 89%. I think it's 88.8 .8 repeating. Okay. And basically you just but actually, anybody who got the right hand side, can you tell me, just tell me how you filled it in to, to get the value? Or like what, what pattern did you use? What method did you use to get to 89%? Can't have been just guesses. Somebody had to have like figured it out, right? So maybe I didn't explain this well. So the, so 
three standard deviations away from 10 in this particular example, the left edge basically is four and the right edge is 16. Does that answer your question? So three, one, ten, and deviation, so four would be two. Ten. No. This is the number of standard deviations, oh. not the value of the standard deviation. Or the or the like width or whatever you want to call it. Okay, so this is three standard deviations away from 10, and this is three standard deviations away from 10 as well. Does that make sense? All right. I also got it wrong, but when I plugged in the thing Yes. Yeah. So, so this is the formula. You just put in the number of standard deviations here is what Z is. Okay. You know, then you square it. So three becomes nine. So one over nine, subtracting one from that, you can get eight over nine. Eight over nine is approximately 88.8 repeat. I mean, it is 88.8 repeating or approximately 89%. So does anybody notice anything really useful about this formula? And the fact that it's, you don't know anything about the problem, except that this mean is, you know, 10 and that the number of standard deviations you care about. So what does that mean we can do? It means we can really simply standardize it, right? So we can just know that for any given problem, if we have kind of that mean and we have the number of standard deviations away, we know how much of the sample space is going to be caught in that. Okay. So, for example, if you're only two standard deviations away, then about 75% will be within that cube, you know, or whatever you want to call it, but, you know, in that range. Um, so, if you're looking at, you know, our four to 16 here, right, it would be smaller than this, it'd be closer to 10. Um, you know, theoretically, let's see, uh, six divided by three would be two. So two standard deviations would be uh, uh, six and what, 14? Um, so <clears throat> in between six and 14 in this data set, whatever it is, doesn't make any difference. 75% of the samples will be between six and 14. Okay. But then we can also look at three standard deviations and we know that 80 you know almost 89 percent of the numbers or the range between 4 and 16 will be uh, or everything will be in there ad infinitum right so 93.75 percent of them will be within four standard deviations or in our stupid example 2 to 18. all right so that's really handy you know from a memorization perspective, you know, whatever, I'm not a big memorization person, um, but if you kind of know that simple formula, you can kind of very easily tell how much of the sample space is in that box, right? So this is really useful. And I think one of the future examples um, we might use is like on grading, for example, it'll tell you how much of the class, for example, is near a particular place. And I think the example we're going to use is actually um, we're going to look at the maternal age stuff again. Um, but as you can see, right, it gets higher and higher, uh, probably approaching one and maybe never actually getting there. But this is the key, right, is that you can just have this table and no matter what the distribution looks like, you know a way to kind of uniformly compare it to other things, right? Or even to some extent, even to itself, right? It's because you know just from a couple of numbers, how far away the distribution or how far, like how much of the sample space is included between point A and point B. Oop, demo. Entirely lost. All right, so. By way of a little setup, sorry, my uh, cheat sheet is not actually open despite me 
thinking it was open. All right, so what we're going to do is uh, first we're going to run this. Nope. We're going to run that. And then we're going to make an array of two, three, and not uh, two, three, three, and nine. Um, and then, you know, as we've talked about in the past, right, this is how we calculate the average or the mean. Um, however, we know a much more efficient way of doing it by just doing mean. Oh boy. And we'll get the same value. Um, and then, you know, we can get more sophisticated about it if we really want to, right? We could actually uh, distribute the, basically the activity right through the numbers themselves. Um, and we'll still get the same result, but there's lots of different ways we can calculate it. But for the sake of, you know, most of the time for this class, you know, we can just use mt.mean, but it is a good idea to have an idea of what's happening underneath with most of these functions, because otherwise you end up uh, getting stuck. Um, so we're just going to turn that into a table so that we can use it in a bit. Um, but then, let's see. Oh, we're going to make it into a table twice. Um, but then we can start to try to figure out the deviations. Um, so does anyone remember, or anyone have a theory about how we can compute the deviations? Let me make sure I have, oh, let me do one more thing. So I'm just gonna stick the mean into a variable so that we have it. Um, so how would I figure out the, basically the deviations from, uh, you know, of the values from the mean, right, on a table. And let's insert it back into the table so that we have now two columns, one that is the uh, original value and then one that's the deviations from the mean. Anybody help me figure that out? So we can start with just the deviations. And we can cheat because we know the values um, are in an array as well, right? Um, so we can kind of reuse that instead of messing with the table. So what, what do we do next to get the deviations? Exactly. So we just subtract the average value. And because of the um, pleasures of Python, this is one of the things I like about Python, um, you can just subtract it directly. And now deviations, let me just drop this in here, uh, actually has the whole array of the, you know, the one subtracted from the other. Um, and we want to know kind of the direction, right? Uh, so that's why we want the negative numbers in there instead of like trying to absolute value it or something like that. All right, so we're just going to attach that to the table. So how would we attach it to the table now that we have that like uh, uh, new array with just the deviations? You all know how to do this. With column, um, and so, but this is one of the ones where we have to remember that we're not actually going to modify the table directly with with columns. We have to like reassign it, right? So that now we get a new table that has our original values plus our deviations, right? And so we're basically just following step by step, uh, you know, albeit somewhat slowly. We're just following like this process, right? So now if you had to take a wild and crazy guess, what do you think we're gonna do next? Square the deviations, right? So do you wanna help me do that?
so I can do it one of two ways. I can either do it kind of directly in the table. Um, so why don't we do it that way? Because it'll be slightly faster. Um, so how would we do that? We haven't done squaring in a while. So maybe syntactically, you'll have to remember how to do a square, which is not the way I default to, because apparently I learned in basic, and that's like the only language that uses a carrot. And most calculators. So, exactly the star star thing. I think that's actually its official type. Um, that is entirely the wrong thing that I cut and pasted. So, I'm going to give it a smart, you know, a, a more intelligent name. Or we're going to call it squared deviation. Then we're going to take um, the deviations we did before, and we can star star two to get the square. And then we'll just print the SC table again. So now we have the deviation itself plus the squared deviation, um, which is about what you expect. Um, I would like to check and make sure it doesn't do something completely weird because I have a typo or something stupid. Um, so anybody notice anything else that happened here? When you square. We got rid of our negative signs, right? So now we're going to take the kind of next obvious obvious step, and we're going to take the mean of the squared deviations, right? So that is what is with my copy paste here today? Um, Oh no, that was that is right, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry. Um, okay, so now we know that the mean of the square deviation is 7.6 or almost 7.7. 7. Uh, and so what we want to do now is we're going to take the square root of that. So let me remember how we do a square root uh, without I think there's a numpy function for it, but using uh, just normal Python syntax. Right. So this one, you know, it, it's harder for other ones, but for the uh, square root, it's pretty easy. Um, so for that, we get uh, looks like just about 2.8. Um, however, we can also cheat by just calling NumPy and asking it for the standard deviation, okay, which is 2.7 or 2.8. Um, so basically, this function is doing kind of all those steps that we just did, but it's doing it inside one function. And as you might, you know, have predicted, right, we could just as easily have written that function as probably should have, rather than trying to go through this each time, because that way we're less likely to make mistakes. So if we want to know what the standard deviation is for any given set of values, we can just use this numpy um, function called std, short for, because programmers are lazy, uh, standard deviation. And then we have the directives to go back to the slot. Um, so we talked about the bounds here. Um, and so now we're going to talk about those standard units. So if we want to know, like, basically, what does this tell us, right? So we know that if we have a negative um, value, like a negative number that we're looking for, uh, kind of from a distance perspective, uh, we know that it's going to be below the average, right? And it's going to be above the average. Um, and however, zero is equal to the average. And I thought if we go back over here, eh, let's not bother. Um, I thought we had another example in there. So when values are in standard units, then the average is going to be at the zero position, right? And the standard deviation is going to be at the one position. Um, and so you kind of have the, you know, percentages along the way. Um, and so, yeah, so going back to that grid, right, we see, you know, with five standard deviations, we're at 96%. Um, so basically, we're between minus five and plus five off of zero. 
that makes sense? Well, we're going to show another example in a second. Um, but I wanted to kind of look at the text version too. Um, and so we're going to look at the, uh, the birth table. Um, however, because we have a column here that is not numeric, we're just going to throw it out for uh, this exercise because it won't, uh, it's not very useful. Um, and otherwise, I'd have to like avoid it all the time. So the first thing we want to see, right, is that we can do a whole bunch of histograms, right? So we can do a histogram for each of these columns. So we can look at birth weight, gestational days, maternal age, maternal height, maternal pregnancy weight. Um, and as you can see, right, these are not all kind of uniform distributions, right? They're, you know, like that one's really nice, but most of them are kind of, I mean, that one's weird because it's got a huge, huge pipe in the middle. Um, although gestational days, I guess, kind of makes sense. But this maternal age definitely has a heart skew to the right, um, which obviously also makes sense. Um, and then like the maternal height is a little bit more uniform. And then the maternal pregnancy weight is kind of like a bit kind of skewed. Um, you know, the data is mostly to the left, you know, but then we have this tail out here of, uh, you know, some of the, the mothers in the, in the data set. So, and the reason we're doing that, right, is so that we can look at the fact that we can use this standard deviation technique to compare them, uh, even though they're not similar, right? Um, or at least to, like, whether we would compare, I don't know if we compare pregnancy weight to height, particularly, but in, in the sense that we can kind of take different kinds of distributions and we can look at them and have the same sense of that what the data is representing. So we can get a much better idea that, you know, maternal height is kind of uniform, right? And that the maternal pregnancy weight isn't, um, even if it's, because you can kind of see it here, but you don't really get a good sense of the scale, right? Because the, the values are in completely different scales. Um, the, you know, uh, like the range, right? Uh, it's just not, you know, it's not very comparable, um, you know, so, you know, maybe what you want to know is how average are these mothers, right? As a, because as we said before, we only have whatever it was, well, let's say a thousand uh, mother rows here. So we would like to know how they are. Maybe we know what the distribution is across the world or whatever. Maybe we want to know how normal they are. Um, so, what we can do is then we can take, let's see. Um, yeah, let's just do this all at once. So we can take one of the columns and looking at the pregnancy weight, we can look at, okay, so the average is about 128 pounds. Um, because kilos would be really weird, so I'm going to guess these are pounds. Um, and the standard deviation is 20. Okay. And then, so what we can do is now we can say, okay, how clustered are the maternal pregnancy weights by looking at, so we stuck our standard deviation into SD. So if we want to know how many are within three standard deviations, so it should be whatever, whatever that was, 88% of the population, um, then we can look at, okay, three times standard deviation versus the mean, and we can know approximately how many there will be in there. And actually, let's just print. Why is that not configuring for me? Oh, okay. Okay, so that kind of gives us that, uh, those standard deviations. Um, and, but more interestingly, what we want to know is like how many of the mothers are in those three standard deviations. So the way we do that is we just divide it. Okay. So we think that within the three standard deviations, uh, the number of rows there and divide it by the total. And so we see it's 98%. So 
how like does that make sense to you considering i just said the three standard deviations is 88 percent but this is 98 percent So because that theorem that we were just talking about um, is a lower bound, okay? So at least that many will be in the population, but it doesn't mean that's all that will be in there, right? So it's not accurate to say that, you know, there will be, let's say 89%, it will be at a minimum 89% and then some, some number over that. Oh yeah, and then I had a I had a simple example to to uh, right. So we see the eighty eight percent. So here's a another like tidbit which I don't think we've talked about before. If for some reason you need all the column names off the table, you can call dot labels, and it will just give you the list of column names as an array, um, and we're going to use that in a second. That's why I'm pointing it out. Um, but it might be handy. Uh, you know, there's there's often methods and functions on most of these objects that uh, we don't use very often, but are pretty valuable. Um, so, what we're going to do is look at all the different kind of data sets, right? So, maternal age, gestation days, you know, whatever the rest of the more maternal height, um, birth weight. And we're going to look at how they do with, I think, oops. Oh, yeah. So two standard deviations, three, four, five standard deviations away from, uh, you know, that and, and what population sits in there to kind of try to prove that theory. Okay. Except this doesn't actually prove it. All it does is show anecdotally for this one example uh, that it works, um, but that's useful. You know, I'm sure you can go find the math on seeing the whole thing. But so, and as I was kind of saying last time, I like to point out that, you know, you use every single thing in here, right? But this is something much more powerful than we've been doing in the past. So taking the, the bits of Python that you know, you can actually turn it into something really useful. Um, and, you know, for example, uh, yeah, so you can do a lot of handy stuff. So what we can look at here, right, is that the birth weight, you know, which, you know, if we look, go back to the histogram, um, the birth weight one is very uniform. So you kind of expect that one to work, um, but it's still, there's, it's actually very, very tight, right? So you can actually see here a little bit, but again, this is like hard to tell from the picture, but, you know, it's actually very, very tight in here. And because it's uniform, we can actually start to look at the fact that, or guess, right, that this is approximately one standard deviation, but, you know, guessing can be dangerous. So, but we see how most of them are gonna fall in there. And we can actually figure it out and they do. Um, so, it is well over the 75%, right? Um, but then I think most of these are clustered pretty tightly. But yeah, so despite, at least for me, right, despite what looks like a lot of variability in the histograms, um, they actually are a lot more uniform in a sense than you might think when you kind of look at them kind of more like apples to apples rather than apples to oranges, because, you know, Two standard deviations away. I mean, you know, 95, 97, 94, 93. That's those aren't bad considering like the change between here and here is 75 and 80, or sorry, 89. Um, so that like separation is actually not a whole lot. So it's kind of interesting that you can kind of start to compare them a little bit more usefully when you look at them in terms of their standard deviation or the distances in the standard deviation. Does that make sense so far? Okay. We're going to talk about this more uh, later too, but we also, like in a future lecture as well. Um, 
So yeah. Um, so as I kind of pointed out in the first place, if it's a bell shape, which we've talked about a few different times, um, it is easier to tell. Um, let me just see what our next slide is. Um, so if it is bell shaped, right? And that's a little bit, you know, it's a little hard to tell necessarily visually, um, but you know, you can figure it out. Then the standard deviation is the distance between the average and the points of inflection on either side. So basically you see where these lines cross and that's how you get to the standard deviation. If you want to kind of do it visually. Which if it's a uniform, like if it's a bell shape or uniform distribution, it can be handy to be able to glance at it, have an idea of what's going on. Um, and then just in case anybody couldn't see it, uh, I just threw it out here bigger. Um, but, you know, so here's that inflection point. Um, and sorry, that point, like, yeah, here. Um, and so, you know, that's what the standard deviation looks like. So. We talk about standard units all right so we can figure out the standard unit by using uh like basically taking that that subtraction of the mean and and dividing it by the standard deviation um and so we just make a little function for that to make it easier later but so if we take all of our ages so the the mother's age um throw that in an array then we can look at the ages in terms of standard units by doing that and so you can see like what we're what we're looking at here is now it's the variation kind of off the average okay instead of looking at the actual raw ages we're looking at the difference between, or we're looking at kind of how they are off the average. And so, and so take the standard deviation and the mean off of those. Um, so the whole thing, right, is gonna be one because it's gonna vary between zero and And then we also know the average of the difference. All right, so then we can make a nice table out of it. Um, and so, did I put this in? Whoops, I did the opposite. I did the opposite more. Um, so does anybody notice anything interesting, like any information that you can kind of figure out from looking at this table? Yes. All right, so if you look at age 33 there, that's almost one. So that's kind of one side of it, right? And then if you look at 27, you see it's nearly zero. So that tells you the standard deviation is about six years. Between the two. Hopefully the next time we talk about this, we'll have more fun examples. Um, So this is our original uh, histogram of their ages, right? Um, and then, but if we look at the age in standard units, 
we can see uh, where's the civil scrolling. Um, let me see if I can get them both here. So you can see the distribution is the same, right? Um, and what do we know about this number here, right? And may have a guess. Like, what do we know about that zero? Right. Um, so it's the average age of the parent, of the mother, um, which we, you know, from prior exercises, we know is about like 27 or something. Um, so, and then we can kind of tell, like, okay, so we know, you know, how how many of them are within one standard deviation away, and then two standard deviations, etc. So we know what population is where by just looking at this histogram um, and not having to worry about kind of the, the raw ages. And then I think I want to talk about the slides again. And so we talked about the normal distribution. Um, yeah. Uh, and so we talked about the standard bell curve or the standard normal curve, um, often referred to as a bell curve, uh, just because it looks like a bell. Um, and so very common. Um, but so when we talk about normal proportions, if a histogram is bell shaped, then that means we know that almost all of the data are in the range of average plus or minus three standard deviations right which is really useful when you want to do something like you know when you have like an exam and you want to figure out how are the students doing right because you kind of you know you want to know what their distribution is around a score right so that you know how far away most of the students are um you know and you're going to have outliers on on anything um, but then again with like the maternal age which is what we were you know, kind of talking about it as an example, um, this kind of gives us a hint about when, uh, you know, we can make a pretty good guess about when most women have children, you know, based on this, you know, arguably relatively small sample um, and probably biased to uh, some country that we don't know for sure. But long story short, you know, for the, by way of example, it tells us quite a bit about the data and about how the, you know, kind of getting a feel for the data uh, and knowing how the data works uh, that may not be obvious or may be very difficult to determine from looking at the raw data. Um, and then, so with a normal distribution, it's much simpler, right? So we can just say 68% uh are going to be within one standard deviation um because we can actually be tighter when it's normal distribution so you know uh you can read the table but basically two standard deviations 75 percent versus 95 percent so those bell curves really do make it a lot easier to get a good sense of where that data is um and then to kind of tie it back a little bit although i think we're gonna be done kind of early i don't know um to tie it back a bit you know you know, we look at those outliers. This was our, you know, we talked about those confidence intervals and that kind of stuff. This this tail out here, you know, these are kind of the same things that we were talking about, except kind of from a different perspective. So we see two standard deviations is 95% of the area. What does that sound a lot like, right? With the confidence intervals that we were talking about, um, you know, it, it's kind of like, I don't know, two sides of the same point. Um, but basically, this tells you a lot about your data set is that 95% of it's falling in this space, you know what the, the range is likely to be with the data that you are interested in. Um, and then like, so depending on how much you know about kind of higher level mathematics, usually things that, that look pretty, right, um, are much easier to start to prove other theories around. Uh, and so as a result, like you can kind of, you know, when you see something that looks nice, it often means that there's a bunch of theories or theorems that fall out of it that make your life easier for other things. So one of them is the central limit theorem, um, which describes how it's connected to random sample averages. 
um, and we care about them because we use them to estimate population averages. Um, I thought I was going to run out of time faster, so I don't have a good example of this today. Uh, so we'll talk about this more next time. So I apologize. Um, but so if the sample is large and drawn at random with displacement, then regardless of the distribution of the population, the probability of the distribution of the sample sum or the sample average is roughly normal. So in other words, um, basically the bootstrapping trick we were doing, um, we you know we can show that the distribution is going to work out well, right? That we know that the you know the stuff's going to fall into this uh, standard deviation. It helps us prove that those um, those techniques uh, work to figure out what you know the sample sum is or the sample average. You know, I don't think we've talked about a single example where the sum is all that interesting, but sometimes it is. Most of the time, we talk about like the sample average or the sample median. Um, and so, what this helps us do is we can look at. Uh, so, this is kind of the backup of why we want to use those techniques and why we think they'll work is because we can use tricks like this to uh, to prove it basically um and yeah like i said i thought i was going to be done a little slower uh so that was all i wanted to cover um but i want to show an example of this i shouldn't think i could get into a good one today so i will have one next time um does anybody have any questions but yeah so i reiterate like standard deviations are really really useful I know it's kind of dry, but it's uh, um, like it's funny. Like when, like I said, when Graham and I were talking about the midterm exams, what we talk about them in terms of is where's the standard deviations of the students taking the exam. You know, um, when you think about uh, when we were talking about the uh, COVID cases, right? You want to look at the standard deviations off the center, like how are most people doing with it, et cetera. So it's a really good way to kind of normalize that data set. So that you can understand what's happening there better, um, and yeah, that's it. And then, as I try to usually do, there's the announcements again, um, and I will ask again. Any questions? <laughs>